In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If I were to describe today's society with one verse from the Bible, I would choose the second part of the 23rd verse of the 6th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, one of the verses that we heard in today's Gospel. When the Lord says, If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Why would I choose this verse to describe today's Western society? Because from what I'm seeing, we are more and more proclaiming, seeing the missing of the mark, amarkia, the missing of the mark, as virtue, as righteousness, as balance, and more and more we are considering or we are told to consider what is of value. What is righteousness, what is good in itself, to be unloving, to be sinful. How did we get here? Because if we look back in the history of humanity, any society had a code of values by which that society functioned. Any society had more or less some kind of ten commandments by which that society functioned. Some of these ten commandments were more inspired than others, but everybody in that society considered that, you know what, these are the rules. These are the values that we guide ourselves by as a society. Our Western society and the North American society came out of the Western European society because it was started, the Western Europeans came to North America, they more or less destroyed the Native American civilization that was here and they imposed the Western European civilization in North America and that's what we are having right now. So, the North American society is very similar, still very similar, to the Western European society. And the Western European society was rooted in the Judeo-Christian society. It was based on the Bible. The values of the Western European society were initially based on the Old and the New Testament <coughs> of the Scriptures. Then what happened to the Western European society? Something very important happened about 500 years ago. About 800 years ago, I should start, I should go back in history even, even a little more. I should tell you that in the beginning of the church, in the beginning of the early church, we had five big Christian centers. Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire, Constantinople, the new Rome, the new capital of the Roman Empire, Alexandria, the center of culture in Egypt, Antioch, the place where, according to the Book of Acts, the disciples were for the first time called Christians, and of course Jerusalem, where everything started. So we had five big Christian centers, Rome, Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. And these five big Christian centers would stay in touch with each other. Because of two major historical tragedies that I don't want to go into all the details, Rome was separated from Alexandria, Antioch, Constantinople, and Jerusalem. And Rome was left alone. This is why the Bishop of Rome started to see himself more and more as the only 
leader of the Christian church. Everybody else was recognized him as the first but among equals. By the 1000, the Christian West could not get along with the Christian East, with the other four Christian centers in the East, and the West and the East were more and more separated. And this is why the Bishop of Rome started to see himself more and more as the most important Christian leader. And about 200 years later, in the 1300s, the Western Christianity, the Roman Catholic Church by now, started to teach that the grace of God is something created, does not come straight out from God, does not belong to God anymore. But belongs to creation. So the grace of God is created and given to the church through the person of the Pope. It's given to the Pope of Rome and then the Pope gives, gives the grace to the church. I'm giving you these details because you'll see that you'll see that everything <laughs> is connected. So all of a sudden in the Western Christianity, and we debate with them a lot about this, you know, St. Gregory Palamas in the 1300s debated a lot with the Western theologians about this, because in the East we said, no, the grace of God belongs to God and is given to the church and upon everybody, and the, upon the whole world. In the West they said, no, it's only the Pope of Rome who receives the grace of God, and then he gives the grace to the church. One and Also, about the same time in the 1300s, in the 1200s, you know, in the West they started the crusades. They need huge amounts of money for for the crusades. They also needed money because they were coming out of the dark ages and they wanted to build these huge cathedrals and they needed a lot of money for the cathedrals. So they started to teach, they started to emphasize way too much the importance of good works, of what we do for, for salvation, to the point of teaching and making it official teaching that the saints of the church did too many good deeds and those good deeds were stored in the treasury of the church and now the church could sell indulgences to people who didn't do so many good deeds and now you will be forgiven for their sins. So it was like a transaction. Some people in the Western Christianity like Martin Luther and Swindy and other so-called reformers said, no, this is wrong. <laughs> and it was wrong. Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic priest <laughs> who was very well intended initially and he went to Rome hoping that the Pope is going to listen to him, but the Pope did not listen to him. <laughs> so Martin Luther went back to Germany and this was in the 1500s, and he started the Protestant, one of the first Protestant churches, protesting against the Roman Catholic Church, and saying he started the so-called Lutheran Church. And unfortunately, you know, he took the things to the other extreme. So he said, you know what? It's not only the Pope who receives the grace of God. Any Christian is inspired by God, and any Christian can interpret the scripture. That was another mistake because in the West they would not give the Bible to the people to read it. The Bible would be only in Latin. Martin Luther translated the Bible in German, which was very good, but then he said, any human being could be like the Pope. Any Christian is inspired by God to interpret the scriptures and to understand the scriptures. What do you think that happened? Do you think that they agree on the interpretation of the scriptures? No. Martin Luther was still alive when other churches were, other churches were being formed from the Lutheran church. Because they lost this idea of the Holy Spirit belongs to all of us. The Holy Spirit came when the disciples were all gathered together with one accord in one place. So basically, he transformed every Christian into a Pope. I am white. 
I'm infallible in what I say, it goes. Because I am inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. Who are you to tell me that you are inspired in the Holy Spirit? The reality is that God exists as three persons in one. As three persons who are always in agreement. And that's how we are all. The other thing that Martin Luther took to the other extreme was it does because the Roman Catholic Church was teaching was overemphasizing the importance of good deeds of the works. Martin Luther said, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you do, we are saved by the grace of God and by faith. Works don't matter. It doesn't matter what you do. This was 500 years ago. What happened in time in the Western, in Western Europe, because people were told that what you say goes, and because it doesn't matter what you do, you are going to be saved anyway, we are ending up today with this society. Where everybody wants to be right and to impose his ways on everybody around him or her. What I say goes and don't tell me that I'm wrong because I cannot be wrong. And the other thing is whatever I do doesn't matter. This is why after about 500 years we are at the point that society seems that doesn't know what is right and what is wrong. Because the reality is that if we look, that was another mistake in the West. They understood sin as something that we do wrong. The trespassing of our law. In the Christian is our understanding of sin is different. Sin is an illness. And if we have this understanding of sin, everything is changed. And this is what the world needs. Because the reality is that which one of us is perfect? Please raise your hand if you are perfect. Do we like to be told that we are sinners and we are wrong and we are going to burn in hell because of our shortcomings? Do we like to be told that? Is it helpful? Does it help you if I told you that if I tell you that you know you're a sinful person, you're going to burn in hell because of your sin, and God is going to punish you? But this is what people have been told. And people started to rebel against this. I would rebel against this. Who would not? But if I am told that you know what? You have some problems, you have some illnesses. I can accept that. Because I know that I am not fully healthy in my body. I inherited some physical ailments from my parents and grandparents. That's, that's how it is. And I know that. And I'm trying to be careful about those physical illnesses, not to, you know, to feed them. In the same way, I inherited some spiritual illnesses from my parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and from generations before. And I'm aware of that, and I try not to feed those spiritual illnesses, but to be healed of them. So this is what the world needs. We don't need laws to tell us what is right and what is wrong. We need love. St. Paul says, you are not under law anymore, you are under grace. This is what Christ came to give to us, the healing grace, and to understand that we are like that man that was coming down from the temple and fell among the thieves. We are wounded in the images of God and we are to be healed. Unfortunately, from what I'm seeing, people, more and more people, cannot accept even to be told that they have a spiritual illness. <laughs> I'm okay as I am, and you have to love me as I am. I love you, but I cannot say that I love you. Your illness. <laughs> because it is an illness. 
You can make whatever you want to make. It doesn't, if it doesn't lead to life, but it leads to death, it's an illness, it's not death. So this is what we need to give to the suffering world around us as Orthodox Christians. This understanding of sin as illness, as healing, and to tell the child on the way to God, on the way to healing, on the way to finding out what is really the light within us, what is really that we are aiming for, what is really leading to life and to God, now and forever, and to the ages of ages. Amen.